Hey guys, my name is Jesse Mew, and welcome back to Adam's Quest. In the last episode, the Baryanas of the Mountains finally made their grand appearance. They actually ambushed two of our different families. Right now, we're dealing with a Baryana over here by our Bluebird leaders, but our very first Baryana attack was over by the stream. The Baryanas snuck up on our two water-breathing brothers, and of course, Dabloon had to swoop in and save the day, because he's a little bit stronger than his brother Mimic. But now they've had a grand feast to share. I'm hoping that they'll be able to make their way toward one of our different families. Maybe even the Ancients, because I'm sure they would enjoy a little bit of extra food. They're about to have another mouth on their hands after all, and we have no idea what sort of genetics will be waiting inside this thing. But before we open that, I did want to go back here to check out the Baryana by Aura. They actually found her while she was trying to catch up to the rest of the tribe. And of course, this mother Baryana is carrying a baby with her. I'm kind of curious if maybe she was trying to get Aura's attention. She does have the purse now, and she was just healing to Fawn and his daughter. So maybe this Baryana baby is a little bit sick and weak, and she was hoping that Aura would be able to heal him too. Unfortunately for her, our tribe often sees Baryanas as nothing but predators, nothing but creatures looking to snack on our tribe. I think Aura's initial reaction of running away in fear isn't going to help her either. At this point, all the tribe sees is danger, and all they know is that they need to protect one of their own. So Tavon, of course, is very excited to see his daughter show off the might of Adam's blessing. She's the only one with those poison fangs, and while she might not be the strongest, that's where Sunflower is going to come in. He just stumbled down from the mountains too after hearing all of this commotion, so I'm hoping that he's going to be able to make up the difference. But of course, those poison fangs will definitely poison the Baryana, and that's going to help us quite a bit. So Tavon, I think we're going to have you stay right there. And I'm wondering if perhaps Trinket would notice all the commotion too. I'm sure she can probably hear the Baryana off in the darkness, and she did just watch her sons take down a Baryana themselves. Maybe she would try to get their attention, try to call them softly to the other side of the stream, because she definitely knows that they could help. But with them being so distracted at the moment, with all of their bunny meat of course, with all the berries they have to gather, they're not very likely to notice their mother calling for them. Sol, on the other hand, would probably notice her nosing around. His big ears are a great help, of course, but he's also sitting high atop the stump right now, so he's been keeping a lookout anyways. In fact, if we bring him right over here, he should not only reveal the spare, you know, once and for all for us, but he should be able to help Trinket escape to the mountain area. That way she won't be stuck in the grasses, and she won't draw the attention of the Baryana either. We really want it to come toward us so we can take care of it properly. You know, I feel like Sol probably always did have a soft spot for Trinket, so it's kind of fitting that he's saving her now. Let's have her scoo all the way down here so she'll be right behind Sunflower. That way she should be able to seek out some warmth too. Maybe we could even have Sol pick up the grass right here, revealing the baby Baryana for us then we won't lose track of him. And that'll be a good way for our tribe to mark out where the Baryanas are going to, just in case they do try to retreat into the darkness. We might even have Daylight scoot over here so she can clear out some extra pathways, some extra modes of escape just in case things get too rough, and just in case her new little baby needs to slink off into the darkness. Of course, Daybreak is on his way back to his mate, and I think that now would be a good time for Frost Howl to lead him back. After all, he wants to leave Ismi here to open the glacier on her own. He knows how much this means to her. This might actually be one of her old tribe mates. She probably figured she would never, ever get the chance to see them again. I feel like she had finally just succumbed to the fact that everything had changed. So this is truly just a dream to her, and Frost Howl understands that she needs to do this alone. So we'll bring him back through the grasses so he can hopefully light up the way for the rest of her family to catch up. Daybreak is so close to the end of his lifespan after all. These are going to be his last few days that he has to spend with her. I suppose we could bring him right across the stream. That way he'll at least be on the right side. But Marigold? 
she's struggling a little bit too much to cross the gap. I don't think she would want to dip her toes into that cold, frigid water. Instead, we might have her retreat back to her brother's side, where he has dug up so many roots. This place looks like an absolute mess now. I don't think he would even waste time with the bunnies. To be honest, he's just after the roots themselves. So he's going to follow his nose. And the closest root is actually right back down the mountain. Kind of right where his father had started the stern. So unfortunately for you, Marigold, your brother is going to be on the move again. He is far too invested in scooping up every last root on this island to stay here and warm you up. That means you're going to be stuck here in all the tall grass. Maybe we'll at least move her right here. That way she can try desperately to warm herself up in this nest with all the tall grass around her like a blanket. I think the only thing that could save her now is if somebody else happened to notice her struggles. And since these two brothers don't have much else to do at the moment, in fact, it looks like all of their fish may have disappeared, maybe they would start making their way toward the other stream and that's when they would cross paths with marigolds. So we'll have Dubloon pick up the grass right here, then maybe jump into the stream. Probably searching for those fish, of course. He knows how much his mother loves them. But now we should be all out of turns. Oh no, we're not. Oh my gosh. Oh, Izmi, I almost forgot about you. We moved everyone away as if she would have privacy with this new tribe mate. And here we almost forgot to crack open the glacier. I am so sorry, Izmi. Well, let's see who's awaiting inside then. Let's see who you're going to reveal. Oh my gosh. Oh, the mammoth foot. Now that is something that I definitely did not expect to see. Oh, look at those giant things. I don't think I've even seen these in the game before. We haven't found this in our Ancient Legends Challenge yet, so it's kind of funny that we find them in Adam's Quest. Of course we would find them on this island instead. But you've got to admit that these two look awfully similar. Aside from those saber fangs and the stripes too. I mean, their fur color is exactly the same, and they do share immunity genes too. In fact, Kuduk, unfortunately, is a little bit sick. That's probably because he spent so much time in the ice, though. Can't be easy to recover after that. So I'm going to assume that this creature is probably her brother. I wonder if he was even her big brother at the time, and now how strange it must be to him. She's so much older than he is, and to him it feels like time has barely passed. So you certainly have quite a bit of explaining to do, Izmi. At least you have a couple of berries over here that you could pick, or a berry bush at the very least. Oh, and tons of food otherwise. You guys are going to be just fine. We'll have you go ahead and clear out the grass right here so you can pick up that food on the next turn. I almost forgot, what exactly does the mammoth foot do? It gives some cold resistance and defense with that big body too. Oh my gosh, he has a three in defense. He could actually withstand quite a few attacks then. I guess that's good to know. If any more Baryinas come crawling out of the woodwork, at least he could be our main line of defense, like literally, he could be our little tank. Let's scoot him on over here so we can clear out some of the grasses with those big feet of his, and hopefully soon he'll be able to meet the rest of her family. And now we should be ready to skip the turn. Right back here with Javon as he sits by his daughter's side and waits for the Baryinas to come after Aura. Oh, you poor thing. I think you're going to have to ask for Tavon to purr for you soon, because unfortunately, Aura isn't going to be able to heal herself. Not unless she can find that legendary healing fruit that we have in the darkness. But right now, Aura, we have some bigger concerns. So if the Baryina is still trying to get her attention, I wonder if she accidentally hurt Aura by reaching out to try to stop her from running. Of course, that's not going to give her any points in our tribe's eyes. Now, if there was any question, they only see her as a threat. So we'll have Aura scoot back here. I do feel like she's starting to realize that maybe this Baryina isn't quite what she seems, but she doesn't know how to communicate that over all of these bloodthirsty war cries. Salami, after all, she is not going to waste a second more. We'll have her dive in, probably from the sea, in fact. That would be the best way for her to land in her sneak attack. What? 
Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, Ismi, no. Oh, we had a rogue male out here. I didn't even check. We have not seen a rogue male for quite some time either. Oh, Daybreak. You are going to be so, so heartbroken when you find out. Oh my gosh. Well, at least these babies won't end up being sick. But there certainly aren't many positives in his genetics. I guess the only plus side is that he does have the antennas in his inactive traits, so maybe he's part of some distant line of oracles too. But still, how on earth are we going to weasel this into our story now? I took Izmi to be a pretty loyal creature. I wonder if maybe she thought that daybreak had passed? I mean, it has been an awfully long time since she last saw him, but oh my gosh, what a bummer on his very last day. So even if they did reunite, she wouldn't be able to have a child with him. That is truly going to break his heart. I guess all we can do is bring her over here. She could settle down underneath the safe haven with a brand new nest. I mean, she did really want to have a super big family. That's why she has so many kids scattered all across the island. So maybe if she thought that Daybreak was gone, she knew she'd have to find a different way to help her family grow. It must also be partially because her brother is here now, and she must have had grand dreams of raising her big family right alongside his. But Frost Travel, this is not going to be a good situation that you're walking into. Let's bring him back here, so he can hopefully lead Daybreak into the grasses. But if Daybreak catches sight of that rogue male, Oh, he is going to just snap. I wonder where he ran off to. Maybe he skittered down the shore somewhere. He must be able to, like, hear him coming or something. We'll have to make sure that you keep your eye on the berry bush too, because it looks like that bunny is eyeing it up. But otherwise, we might as well head back to the Baryinas, because there's not much that we can do over here anymore. So the Baryina is poisoned now. Salami was successful in that, at least and I think that she would end up using her last turn to swipe the Baryina too. Again, it's really not going to do that much, but the distraction leaves an opening for Sunflower to swoop in. So he'll lunge over to Salami's side too, a glittering golden knight to the very end, and with two of his turns, he should be able to take down this Baryina with no trouble at all. And now all they have left is this little Baryina baby to deal with. I wonder if some of her tribe mates, some of Aura's tribe mates, would try to convince them that they need to get rid of it. I mean, it could end up being a threat to their children too, and they do have some very young babies to keep track of. But Aura isn't about to listen. Now that she can examine this Baryina baby up close, she's going to swoop him up right underneath her wing without a second thought. She can see that he's really hurting too. So, let's go ahead and have her purr for him. I wonder... No, it doesn't look like it actually puts the healing magic on him. That's too bad. I guess it only works truly for our own tribe mates. But we can at least pretend that some of that healing magic is working its way through his system. And it's making him feel much, much better already. So that sure to weigh heavily on Aura's mind that she wasn't able to stop the tribe from slaying the Sparina's family, but at the very least, she can make sure that nothing ever harms him again. Now, before we go any further with this, I do want to see which one of our creatures ended up freezing. Yeah, I figured it would be you, Marigold, but it looks like you have all of your energy. That's a little bit confusing. She didn't take any damage, and she can definitely move around. So I wonder if Melody has given her a second chance. Well, I know you are going to be very, very grateful to our Herald of Flames for warming you up, but you'll be even more grateful if our water breathers can make it to your side in time. Mimic may have been distracted by the bunnies, but oh my goodness, Frostbite. How many rabbits do you have over here? Ah, uh, and it looks like our rogue male friend has made his grand return too. Awfully close to daybreak. If he scoots just one tile closer, I think he might be able to take a swipe. Well, Frostbite, come on down here. You can dig up those roots. Yeah, I think he's trying to return to Izmi's side. Oh, he probably has no idea that Daybreak is her mate. 
Well, go ahead and send him packing Daybreak. This is your one chance to get revenge. It's such a sad way to end his story. These two were always so close, and I just can't believe that she gave up hope. I feel like he'll probably just stay in the grasses, not even let her see him again, because he can't bear to show her how heartbroken he truly is. It's almost as if he's passing away on this day of a broken heart, which is just unbearable. I guess all we can hope is that Frostbite will tell one of his kids so they can put his sad soul to rest. Now, let's bring Dabloon over to Marigold's nest as we were planning. We'll have him settle down right here, and now with his warmth beside her, she should be a little bit more willing to pick up the tall grass around the nest. We do know Dabloon's family to be very, very romantic, so I wouldn't be surprised if he has a little bit of that pirate blood in him too. If perhaps he's thinking about sweeping her right off her feet, and maybe starting a little family here over by the stream. This was where we figured it would be the best place for them to have their BBs anyways. It's right in between those two water sources. So maybe Splash would have a bit more influence here, as long as they remember to go pick up that algae, of course. That's something that Trinket has stashed away for days. And you know, she is starting to feel quite cold again. This is probably a very familiar sight now, isn't it, Soul? Let's have Daylight skitter over here. That way her baby can follow. And perhaps we could have Trinket settle down right in between them, so she should be nice and toasty warm now. She could even, perhaps, use one of these nests. Again, her family is known for being quite romantic. And to be honest, I feel like Soul probably had a bit of a soft spot for her anyways. They did spend quite a bit of time together right when we landed here. Hunting for shells, of course. Well, he was always hunting for the worms, but they spent quite a bit of time together right in the ocean. So, now that he's saved her yet again, maybe she's wondering if she could continue her family with him too? We'll just have to make sure that we alter their mutation menus, because I would like to see that platypus beak live on. So I believe we're going to have to place the platypus beak into her slot. I'm not sure if it would be more dominant than the gills. She's pretty much guaranteed to pass that either way, but I suppose either of them would work for this family. Now as for Soul, I think we're going to work on some more practical things, like the eyesight, and of course, the fertility too. His fertility is rather low, and we want to make sure that it's not going to become a problem in the future. So go ahead and breed with Soul, if we can. There we go. And the bunnies are still skittering around these ports, I see. I actually thought that maybe Daylight would have just one more prophecy. She's getting so close to the end of her lifespan, too. So maybe she would send Dawn Soul off with a vision of the healing fruit, so she could try to sniff it out with that big nose of hers. So that's what Dawn Soul's mission is going to be, to find the healing fruit for all of her healer siblings to use, but not before she picks up a couple more of those snacks for the road. We'll have Daylight try her best to carve out a pathway for her daughter, so it should be easier for her to get to work. But other than that, I think that should be the last of our turns. We could perhaps just have Soul sing out from the tree stump. You know, I feel like he probably just never knew how to voice his love for Trinket, but now that he's learned to sing from the stumps, it's probably much, much easier for him to show his true colors. Let's go ahead and skip the day, though. And I think we're going to go back here, because I do want to see what Izmi's baby is going to look like. I think it's pretty much guaranteed to look quite a bit like his father, with the derp snout and that no paw. A bit of a cursed baby, if you will. But with Daybreak's restless soul, that is certainly no surprise. Quite interesting how her ram horns seem so light in color. They're not quite the crown of bones that Moon Eye and Crescent were known for, but they are much more similar than so many others in our tribe. So I wonder if there is actually a little bit of a connection there. Just a gift to show that they're watching. They're watching and they know that it's going to take a lot of work to ensure that Daybreak doesn't haunt this tree for the rest of his days. I did notice that she had the antennas in her inactive traits, so I guess those passed on after all. That's always a good sign. It means we could potentially pull out even more oracles in the future. But I think we're going to name this little baby Shine to go along with that beautiful golden fur of hers, of course, and to go right alongside the rest of Izmi's family, too. 
I wonder what they're going to think of this betrayal. I think she's pretty much the only one who didn't know he was still alive. I think we'll probably want to leave her right on this nest so she doesn't attract the rogue male's attention again. We'll have her pick up all of the grasses around her, just clear out this area so the rest of our tribe mates will be able to find it too. This is where the ports are after all. Oh, we have a little Dotamingo friend lingering around here as well? That's interesting. I wonder if the Dotamingo's coming by to babysit all of our new little children? They do love to settle down by the nest, so I wouldn't be surprised. Now, Frost Towel, I guess you're going to leave this baby in the protection of the ancients, because you have a message to carry. The question is, which one of his children would he try to seek out? Marigold and Frostbite both have the digging paw, so either of them could work. But Marigold, while she did dig up her fair share of fruits, she never seemed particularly connected to the gravediggers. I think that role is truly going to fall on Frostbite's shoulders, because he's pretty much single-handedly devoured every last root on the island. So that means it's going to be a little bit of a longer journey for you, Frost Howell. We'll bring you up here to the stream again, so you can hopefully catch his attention. In fact, you have so many roots over here, I'm sure that Frostbite would like to go see it. You can probably smell these off in the distance, so tantalizing of course. But he is being called by an oracle, and the oracles have got to know their stuff too. So let's bring him over to the stream as well. I'm a little bit worried to have him try to cross this gap. It seems like that might be a bit too dangerous, so maybe instead we'll have to have him go around. We could bring him up to the stump at least, that way it should be easier for him to lunge across. And you, Frost Howl, you better start picking off these bunnies because there are far too many hopping around these parts. Oh, and look at this. We do have a little platypus baby in the nest. Excellent, so Soul's ways are going to live on. Now unfortunately it looks like this baby did end up getting sick. I knew that there was a possibility with their immunity genes. That was why I didn't breed them initially, but I figured we've had such good luck so far. Maybe we could weasel some healthy babies ahead of them too. But unfortunately, it looks like he's going to have to stay right by our healers for the rest of his life. I also think I see the nimble fingers on him, which is really, really nice to see. That's something that only Trinket currently has. So she's the only creature who could go to the safe havens to gobble up all of those acorns. He's actually going to make for an excellent food collector to ensure a safe passage through the mountain that's ahead. I love how they named him Takir too. Takir the Pattern Painter. And you know, he does have some pretty interesting spots on him, though it's hard to see with the dark pattern on his fur. You know, with the platypus beak? It almost makes him look sick too. He has those dark circles around his eyes. I wonder if maybe he would have had a much brighter fur color if not for his illness. Maybe we'll name him Gold then? To go alongside all of his pirate origins of course, just like Trinket's family. But it's only his illness that doesn't allow his true colors to shine through. I don't think either his mother or his father would leave his sight though. And in fact, let's have Dusk Soul try his hand at purring for all of them, just like his big sister. He's probably been watching from a distance as she tries her best to heal this friendly Baryina. And it seems like your friendly Baryina does indeed enjoy your presence. I wonder if we moved her a little bit further away if he would follow? First though, I do want to swipe up these bunnies because it looks like they're trying to steal your food again. Poor Daylight, she can't get your break even on the last of her days. I think she's pretty happy with the state of her children, though. She has Aura, who's trying her best to become a true healer, just like her father. And it's clear that she has a different heart compared to most of our tribe mates. Then she has Dawn Soul, who's going out on her own mission. Sniffing around for the healing fruits? Are you kidding me? So we actually do have a healing fruit in this vein of grass too, and that is the perfect thing for her to bring her little brother over to. Maybe she would even call out to him, let him know that she's found something he will be very, very happy to see in the darkness. And I guess in the next episode, we'll have him get to work with the healing fruits, clear out this area, and maybe even see if he can heal his big sister. 
But yeah, let's have her scoot on this way. Maybe right up the mountain? Just to see if she can lure him away from the tribe. She's probably still a little bit untrusting. She doesn't know if perhaps Sunflower or Salami is going to turn on him. But she doesn't have much to worry about. Sunflower is such a big, lazy goof. He's just going to go off and search for more of those clover beds to lay his in. And Salami is going to be a little bit busy anyways. Because with this being Devon's final day as well, he's going to have to pass those precious bluebird feathers over to his daughter next. So now that they know the true stories of Adam, he knows that she is going to be a much more valiant leader, and she does have the fangs to prove it. So once her father passes and it's her turn to take charge, I think she's going to start leading the tribe straight over to those ports. It's just basically a hop, skip, and a jump away from here. And it looks like the bluebirds have returned too, almost as if they're urging her to go in this direction. So I think in the next episode, maybe our families will even cross paths. Sooner or later, they'll all have to merge together as one once more, and Salami will have to choose who's fit to travel on. But for now, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Bye guys!